Hello, and welcome to Intro to HPC. My name is Michael Rockford. I am an employee here at the Yale Center for Research Computing. Um, on the bottom left, you will see a link to the slides that we will be showing today. These could be useful for following along with commands that we teach you today, along with a link to examples that we'll be using to practice the skills that we teach today. Later on, my coworker, Aya Nawano, will be joining us in the video to go over some additional things about the HPC systems at Yale. So this presentation is mostly for new users or users who need a refresher. We will open with a little information about how high-performance computing systems work and what they are. I will then go over the different methods to log into the clusters at Yale along with useful Linux commands for navigation and file creation. I will go over transferring data, interactive jobs, and batch jobs. And then we will discuss common user issues with solutions and leave information on how to contact the YCRC for when you need support. So there are some activities for this video. Uh, I would encourage that in the, those times when those activities pop up that you pause the video and try to complete the activities yourself. If you get stuck, you may continue the video and the solution will be shown in the following slide. So Yale Center for Research Computing is an independently funded center under the provost's office. Uh, we are a group of employees consisting of about 20 people of a mix of engineers and research supporters. Our focus is on providing high performance computing and storage to users across the across Yale and to the and with their collaborators. Uh, all of us are available to consult with and educate users as needed. And you can find more information at us at research.computing.yale.edu. Additionally, we do actually have a docs page that provides information on using the cluster at docs.ycrc.yale.edu. Our goal is to support your research computing needs. So it's always a benefit to reach out to us if you're struggling getting something up and running on the cluster. So what is a cluster? This is a supercomputer. It consists of hundreds of thousands of rack-mounted computers. What this does, it provides enhanced computing ability and increased storage compared to your personal machines. This gives a number of reasons to actually use the cluster, including Maybe you, the work you're doing is too slow on your personal machine or doesn't have enough storage for the data you're trying to analyze. Additionally, you may not have GPUs, whereas the cluster has a number of GPUs available for use uh, free of cost. Maybe you have a large number of jobs that your computer just can't handle or it needs to run for a long time and you want to be able to turn your computer off. We, uh, the YCRC also provides access to a number of software programs that may not be available on your machine. We also have a number of very large databases available for analysis and you get our support. What that means is that if you are struggling to get your code running or you have a program you want to use, but you just can't get it installed, you can reach out to us and we will help you get it running up and on the cluster. So at this moment, we have three clusters. Um, our oldest now is Grace with 29,000 CPUs. Its purpose is mainly for general use. This is where you'll see traditional computer science, computer modeling simulations like physics, um, along with new social sciences like psychology. McCleary is our most recent addition to the HPC system. Uh, some of you may remember Ruddle and Farnham. They have now been discontinued and combined to create McCleary, a better and faster system compared to its previous generations. Uh, this currently has just over 13,000 CPUs and is reserved mainly for medical life science and YCGA. Uh, YCGA is the Yale Center for Genomics Analysis. Finally, we have Milgram. Milgram is our HIPAA compliant cluster. If you are doing any type of sensitive information analysis, you will be getting an account on Milgram where you can safely upload and download that data as needed. So accessing the clusters is a somewhat complex process depending on the user. We have provided a number of methods for accessing the cluster, but first to even be able to access the cluster, you need to be on the correct internet connection. That means you either have to be on Yale Secure or Ethernet on campus or be on the Yale VPN. 
You also have to be on the Yale VPN if you're ever trying to access Milgram, no matter whether you're on campus or not. There are three general methods to logging in. The command line SSH is most commonly used on Linux or Mac OS. There's often graphical SSH tools like Mova Xterm or Cyberduck. Um, these are more commonly used in Windows. And finally, we provide a third application called Open On Demand. This is a web-based application that allows you to log in and navigate the cluster just like you're surfing the web. The first two methods to use SSH, which is a secure login and requires an SSH key. Uh, information about setting up an SSH key and putting it on the cluster for simple logins is seen in the docs page that I have tagged to the bottom of this slide. So a little bit of information about the cluster. Um, once you have logged in, you will appear on the login node labeled there. However, when you are doing any work, you're going to want to be on a compute node. This is because these login nodes are very limited in their computing power. The nice thing about these HPC systems is that even though you're technically on a different place than when you logged in, um, those files are shared no matter where you are in the cluster. So you can log in to different locations on the cluster and still have access to the same files. All computations will happen on these compute nodes, which I'll get into a little bit more later. So we are going to log into the cluster now. Um, I encourage that you, again, pause the video and follow along. You can log into the cluster using the link provided here. This will take you to the OOD homepage that looks like this. Um, the red box highlights the different links to the connections depending on which cluster you're trying to access. All you do is click one of these links and it'll take you to the main open on-demand webpage where you can log into the cluster. Once you have logged in, you will see a page like this with your username in the top right saying you're logged in. Um, we will now go over a number of the important buttons available on this web page. So right away on the front, you'll see a list of popular apps, but that is not all of the apps. And in the top left on this apps dropdown menu, you can click this and it will give you access to all the applications installed and open on demand. Um, what, what I mean when I say these apps is that sometimes if you're just trying to use one of these popular programs, you don't necessarily even have to go near a terminal or navigate the cluster. You can just launch Jupyter or MATLAB directly from this web page and it'll open as if it was on your personal machine. If you have other apps that aren't available on this open on demand, then you can just log in using a remote desktop or a terminal and load the app as normal and it will still work just as fine through open on demand. The files tab is gives you access to the three main locations in your account. Um, that is your home project and scratch. And finally, your My Interactive Sessions will tell you what sessions you already have running. So Open On Demand does have a limit of four interactive sessions per user. Um, so you have to be careful about how many you have running at one time, or you may run into that limit. The nice thing, the really nice thing about Open On Demand is that unlike your personal machine, or if you've logged into the cluster traditionally, if you close your computer or turn it off, you'll lose that connection to the cluster. And whatever you're running may stop depending on how it's been submitted. With Open On Demand, you can close a web page, open up on open up, open the website on a different computer if you want, and you'll still be able to log in via this My Interactive Sessions tab as long as your session is still running, which is based on the time limit that you specified. Um, to go to delete a session, the only way to end a session is either for the time to run out or to click the delete button um, when on the active session. Finally, the clusters tab will allow you to open a terminal to directly access the cluster as if you had logged in via SSH. We are going to proceed in the video using this terminal um, to go over the Linux commands useful for navigation and file creation. So I encourage everyone here to click this tab and open the terminal. So when you log in, you will see a screen like this. Um, a lot of text that I will go over here, to, a lot of it is important, but does tend to get glossed over by regular users. So right away, you'll see the cluster you get logged into. Um, and, and then immediately following that is our permanent announcements. This includes information like cybersecurity protocols, information about the cluster, 
uh, ongoing maintenance, along with important information for you involving how much how to check how much storage you've used or the paths to your main directories. Um, and when the next main plan maintenance is, which is a time when the cluster will be unavailable to users. The next section is our message of the days or temporary announcements. These include announcements again on upcoming maintenances, new workshops that we will be hosting, along with maybe new technical cluster issues that are impacting cluster use that we are currently trying to solve. This is constantly changing and is recommended to be read at least on a relatively common basis by the users. Finally, you will see that you have now logged in with your username at the login node at the cluster that you have chosen to log into. In my case, this is McCleary, along with this squiggly line. That line represents your home directory, which I will get into again more in detail later. So a useful Linux command, one of the most useful Linux commands for navigation is ls. This stands for list, and what it does, it lists all files and directories available in your current location. I encourage you to type it in yourself. When you do that, you will see uh, the list of files available in your home directory, which will include your project to scratch, as I mentioned before. Now, a little more detail about those locations is first your home directory. This is your default location when you log in. This stores links to your other locations that I mentioned before, project and Palmer scratch, or in the case of Milgram, just uh, scratch 60. Your project directory is your long-term storage. This has a lot, a lot more space than your home directory, um, and it is permanent storage. Most work will be completed here, and this space is available for access by via your other group members. So it's very useful for uh, collaborative work. Finally, your Palmer Scratch is your largest directory, but this is also a temporary storage location. Um, any file that's created here will be deleted after 60 days post-creation. Um, it's a great location for temporary storage of large data files or large analyses that you can back up or move to a different location when the analysis is done. Uh, there are other flags that you can use for LS that will display more information about files, including things like hidden files. You can find information about those flags at the link that I've provided below. So the next key command is not necessarily a Linux command, but it's a command that we provide here at the YCRC. This is called get quota. What get quota does is it lets users and PIs know the total storage available in their key directories. Um, these key directories, again, are their home, project, and scratch 60, but there may be other directories depending on uh, the group or user using the cluster. A little information about these key locations is, again, your home directory, as I've highlighted before. This is your default location and is a great place for scripts and final results. Uh, each user gets 125 gigabytes per person, and this is a backed up location. Project is your large collaborative workspace. Um, groups will have one to four terabytes to share between their members. Um, this is a great place to keep solutions or ongoing analyses. This is not a backed up location, so you should keep a secondary location of anything important. We do provide a thing called snapshots, where if you actually delete something within 72 hours, we have the ability to recover it. But after 72 hours, that data will be gone. Scratch 60 or Palmer Scratch, is a temporary shared location. Like I said before, this data is purged after 60 days after creation. Um, but this provides your most space, where each group gets about 10 terabytes of space per group. Now, key another key part of this is that your home directory is your own personal location. So it's 125 gigabytes per person. Um, but Project and Scratch 60 are shared between your um, group. So if your whole group is 10 people, then you may have only then a, a good use practice would be only using a tenth of the total storage that your group has access to. This makes it important to delete and remove files that you're no longer using in your project and Palmer Scratch so as to ensure that your group has enough access for other research going on in your group. Now, if you have additional storage, it may have been purchased by your PI. This is PI storage and that storage amount varies. Um, any PI can purchase storage. All you have to do is reach out to YCRC and we can set up the PI with methods for purchasing storage. 
If you're part of the Yale Center for Genomics Analysis, you will have a separate directory called uh, work. This comes with an additional four terabytes of space and can be changed depending on usage um, after a discussion with device CRC. Uh, this work will be, this directory is reserved only for work with YCGA. And finally, you may have access to storage at Yale. Now, this is different from campus storage at Yale, but it's still a ITS provided service. Um, this is also mainly used via YCGA for storage of archived and genomic data. This data is only accessible via the transfer node, as it is usually only accessed um, for transferring the data to a different location. I'll get more into the transfer node in a little bit, but for now, the get quota command. When you type get quota, you'll be displayed with a long wall of text that will first list each user in a space you're using. Uh, we will ignore that for this video and just focus on the second portion of the get quota output, which is the horizontal portion. Uh, what you will see is a list of your home locations, of your main locations that you have access to, which will include your home, project, and scratch, along with any additional storage locations, which may be PI storage like I have here, or YCGA, which is also displayed. For that, the two important columns are your usage and file count, where you can see the total storage you're taking up or your group is taking up, which you can tell by looking at the type. So in the case of home.mcleary, it is a user storage and I am using 42 gigabytes. But as a group in my project directory, we're using 5.2 terabytes of data in our project directory. Now you'll notice that I highlighted file count. Well, that is because there's actually a limit on both storage, um, on data size and file limit. Um, whereas you can see here that that 125 gigabytes is limited to your home directories I mentioned before, but that size for your project and PI support can all vary. Um, we do have to main insist on file limit because too many files can also impact the performance of the cluster for other users. So what happens if you get near your maximum like we did for uh, PI support directory? Well, then when you type the get quota command, it will print out this additional warning. This warning will say that you are at or near your storage limit and reduce files stored there to ensure that you avoid any issues with storage limitations. And if you get filled, you will start to have issues using the cluster. You won't be able to write new files, install con environments, or upload new files in that location until space is cleared. If you have filled your home directory, open on demand will no longer function properly. So if you're experiencing issues like apps aren't appearing or you can't even launch open on demand, I would recommend logging into the cluster and checking your quota to make sure your home directory is not full. So the next command for, is useful for navigation. This is called CD and PWD. Uh, CD stands for change directory. CD will let you navigate to different directories. So we're gonna navigate to our project directory. To do that, all I have to do is type in CD space project from your home directory. You will now see that our location has changed from the home to the project directory. A fun tip um, for future navigation is cd dot dot will let you navigate backwards. So this will put you back in your home directory in this case. For now, we will stay in the project directory. PWD will print the location of your current path. So this will tell you where you currently are within the cluster. If we type it within our project directory, we will get a path like this where we start backslash home, backslash your username, and then the project directory. This is very useful if you are storing scripts or data in a different location than where you are running, because then you can point those files to those locations without needing to have everything in one location, which can be nice for organization. Nano will let you create and edit files. In this case, we are going to create a file called test.txt. So in your terminal, go ahead and type nano space test.txt. When that happens, a new screen will pop out that it will look like this. You will see your file at the top right, the top middle of the screen that popped up, along with a bunch of different commands available on the bottom of the screen. Now, first, the TP symbol is a stands for the control button. Um, so in any of these cases where you see this image for nano, it means press control first. 
you will see that all of the letters are uppercase, but it's actually not cap sensitive. So you can just do control lowercase g to get help on nano usage. Now to go over some of the more commonly used nano commands, um, control O will let you rename a file. So if you want to edit an existing file, but not overwrite it, you can use control O to save it to a different file name. Control W will let you search for a specific pattern. If you're looking to edit a specific portion of your file and it is too long or too complicated to navigate easily, you can use Control W to look for a specific pattern. Finally, Control K and Control U will let you cut and uncut text similar to Microsoft Word. However, the only difference is that it only does lines. You cannot cut a portion of text. So now we are going to write we are going to create our test.txt file by writing anything we want in it. Um, it doesn't need to make sense, and it won't be, it won't have any impact on the final results of this activity. So once you have entered your file, you will see that you have text inside this file. In this case, I have created a dancing man using some fun symbols. Um, but now we have to save the file. And how do we do that? That is by using control X seen here. This will let you close the file and save edits. So when you type control X, another prop, another prompt will appear that says, are you sure you want to save these changes? You hit Y for yes. And it goes, are you really sure you want to overwrite your existing file? This is the name of the file that it was. And you go, okay, I do. And you just hit enter and it will save the file. Now, if you use ls, you can see that you now have a file called test.txt in your project directory. However, as you can see here, having a one directory for all your storage can get um, clunky. It's best practice to make new directories that reflect the work being completed with the projects that you're working on. You can use makedir or mkdir, which stands for make directories, to create new directories for good organization. So in this case, let's create a directory called workshop. To do that, you just need to type mkdir space workshop in your project directory. Now, when you use ls, you'll see that a workshop directory now exists inside your project directory. So now we've created this new workshop directory, but we still have test.txt in its original location. For best practice, we should move that to our workshop directory to ensure it's in its proper place for easy finding in the future. To do that, we can use the CP or MV command. Uh, CP stands for copy and MV stands for move. What copy will CP will do is copy a file directory from lo one location to another. In this case, that file will exist both in its original location and a new location. MV or move moves the file to a different location. In this case, that file will only exist in the new location. The proper syntax for copy and move is to type CP or MV space path to your file or file name and then the file name space path to the destination you want to copy it to. Again, this is another time where PWD is useful to find the location of where you currently are and for copying and pasting of the pathing for your copy and move command. So in this case, let's copy the test.txt file from your project directory to your workshop directory. Use PWD to get the pathing for your project and workshop, and then use copy to copy that file to your test to your project, to your workshop directory. Um, if you need time, please pause the video and try to work it out yourself. Otherwise, the solution will be on the next slide. A fun fact here is that the symbol uh, period, it will indicate your current location, i.e. if you use this in the command copy, it will say copy to the, where I currently am in, in the cluster. So I would, we present the solution here. From within my project directory, I typed PWD to get the path of the project to location. I then CD to my workshop folder and use PWD again to get that path. I then typed copy. I copied the path of my project location and added the file name test.txt to the end. And then in this case, I used the period as I was already in the workshop directory. So I was saying I wanted to put this file in my workshop directory that I'm currently in. I hit enter and the file completed. 
I can then use LS and I could see that test.txt was now available in my workshop directory. But we still have, but how do we know that copy was complete? Well, we can look at things like text viewers such as cat or less, or you can look at the size of your file and make sure it matches the same size as what you copied. And that is accomplished using something like LS or DU. For text viewers such as cat and less, you can use cat to print the file directly to your terminal. This is great for short files, or if you're trying to copy something from one file to another location or for quick checks. To do that, you can use the syntax here, which is cat space name of the file. That is displayed here where I have typed cat space test.txt and my dancing man has appeared on the screen. Less similar to cat, well, let, but much more similar to nano, actually we will open a new file in the terminal. It will be uneditable, unlike nano. This is great for larger files, specifically because it has a search function. So you can look for specific patterns. And it's really nice if you want to check for specific output, or copy a specific section of the file somewhere else. The syntax is very similar. It's just less space file name, at which point the new screen will open and will look something like this, where my dancing man is now on his own screen. To exit a less file, you can press Q. So we still have that test.txt file right now in your project and your workshop directory. As I mentioned earlier, it's best practice to keep your file usage to a minimum so that you don't affect the performance of the cluster for your group members. So we're going to go ahead and try to delete that original test.txt file from its project location. To do that, we'll use a command called rm, which stands for remove. This will delete objects such as files or directories. The syntax for that is rm space file name to delete a file or rm space uh, hyphen r space directory will delete a directory in all of its subdirectories and files. Now you should be very cautious using this command because it will delete everything and it will be unrecoverable in most cases. So you need to be sure that what you're deleting is what you want to be deleted when you're deleting a directory. Um, it's best practice to use rm to remove unwanted files to stay below a storage quota for yourself and your group members. However, if you do actually delete something and those are in 72 hours, you can access it using something called snapshots with this link provided here. Um, these snapshots will give you access to temporarily deleted data for 72 hours. But after 72 hours, if you have only just noticed that there will be too late and that those files or directories will be gone permanently. So what we are going to do is navigate back to your project directory. Remember that if you're in your workshop directory, you can use cd dot dot to go back one, one directory back to your project directory. Um, and we're going to remove test.txt using the rm command. And then we will use ls to confirm that test.txt is no longer present. Again, please don't hesitate to pause the video. The solution will be showed on the next slide. So from my workshop directory, I have used cd dot dot to get back in the project. I then typed rm space test.txt. The command completed and I typed ls and you can now see the test.txt is no longer inside my project directory. Again, I we encourage this type of practice to for best practice to ensure proper functioning of your account and storage maintenance for yourself and your group. So finally, how do we even get files to and from the cluster or to different locations in the cluster? Copy and move are great, but if you have a big file, it may not be your best solution for moving. Uh, before I really get into that, we first need to discuss more a little bit about the cluster architecture. So prior to transferring files, it's important to be on the transfer node. You can do that by typing SSH transfer on your screen on your terminal. What you'll see is that instead of being on login two or login one, you will now be on your username at transfer. This indicates that you are on a transfer node. Um, but of course, why should we be off the login node? Well, there's a number of reasons for that um, that I'll try to explain here. So again, I display, display the general architecture of our clusters here at Yale. Um, the general thing is that you'll have your login node where you start your login, um, and then you will have your transfer and your compute nodes. Your transfer node is mainly for transferring files and is optimized to do so, um, and also consists of only one node. 
you will also see the login node actually is accurately represented and only actually represents two nodes. However, your compute, which represents about 99% of our cluster, is where all calculations will be should be completed, um, including any submitted interactively. You can access compute nodes from the login node by using commands such as sLF or doing a slurm submission, which will be explained later. Um, once you have access to the node, depending on whether you want to transfer files via the transfer node or to run calculations into compute node, you would then submit the job and the job would complete. So what happens if we have a user following these best practices? What will happen is that we have a user that accesses the cluster. He is now taking up a small portion of the login node um, by logging in, but he wants to run some calculations. So he moves over to the compute nodes using SILOC in this case. You will see that the space is now cleared up in the login node for the next user. And he is taking up one a small portion of the compute node. He then submits his job and maybe takes up a whole node, but that's fine because there are a, a large number of compute nodes for users to use. His calculations run and his job completes. Now the next user can log in easily to the cluster and he can log into a compute node and run his jobs easily. However, in the case of bad behavior, let's say that first user has logged into the node and is on the login node. And now he does not move to the compute node prior to trying to run his calculations. Now he's taking up a whole login node, which is half of the login nodes available to all of the people trying to log onto the cluster. What happens here is that this causes a massive slowdown on the cluster for all users. In some cases, these users may not be able to log in, or they may have trouble editing files. It may even be hard to even just change directories or copy a simple file. In this case, a bunch of people will now be trying to log in and won't have access. They will be unhappy, and we will get complaints, and then we at the YCRC will have to reach out to you and say, we've killed your job, don't do this again. We really don't want to do that. So please try to make sure you're on the right nodes for your jobs. Um, whether it's transfer node to complete, to transfer file, transfer large files or the compute node to uh, complete your calculations. So if you happen to do this, you will also have optimized workflows. The compute nodes are best designed for um, ca calculations. The transfer node is best designed for file transfers and the login node is designed mostly for easy access to the cluster and for simple file edits. So as I said, that login node consists of two nodes shared between all YCRC HPC users. It is reserved mainly for logging in. And like I said before, those large, anything larger can impact the performance of the cluster for all the users on the cluster. We do impose restrictions on the cluster for the login node. So if you don't realize you're on the login node, but you try to install a Anaconda environment or install an all our library and it fails, Double check that you're not on the login node uh, because it will crash due to the limits that we have imposed. If you do all of this and are on the right location at all times, you will get happy YCRC staff members and no, no um, disappointed emails from the staff here at the YCRC. So now we can finally get into transferring and downloading files. There are actually a number of methods included to do so. Um, you can find the wiki page about the different methods along with more information on how to use the methods I will show today um, on this web page at the top of the screen. So transfer between two locations in the cluster, I've already shown copy and move, but there is also rsync, which is a, a, a generally better copy command depending on the size of your file. What it does is you can get a progress bar so you can see how far along that copy that transfer is and also transfers file permissions. So you have changed the permissions of your file to allow access for other members of your group or outside users. Those permissions will be transferred to the new location. This is not the case with copy. Now, if you want to transfer from the cluster to an outside location or vice versa, there's another and there's even more options. You have the open on-demand file upload and download that I showed before. Um, this does have a 15 gigabyte limit, so anything larger than that, you have to use a different method. wget is a quick and dirty method to download data that comes from a link. All you have to do is send wget space the link to the file, and it'll work. rclone is great for accessing cloud storage. Um, you have to set up a config file, which is shown in that page I showed at the top. 
uh, to, and then you can connect to Box, AWS, Wasabi as needed to transfer and, or upload files as necessary. Finally, we have Globus, which is an additional application that Yale provides to its users. This will allow you to transfer files directly to the cluster without um, monitoring it. This is our best method for transferring, but does have its own setup required. Um, that link you can find below the Globus section on this slide to describe how to set up an account and set up a Globus transfer. You will find for large files, you will find the fastest transfers will occur with Globus. Finally, there is SCP, um, but it is a little dirty and can be a little finicky. So we encourage you to use one of these other options instead of SCP. Um, if you are downloading a GitHub repository, whether it's yours or someone's that you're copying to install a program, you can use the git clone command. This will download the, the repository directly to your account as if you were accessing the repository on the web. So for the next step, we are going to download the workshop files for the exercises coming up that Aya will present to you. Um, what we're going to do is download a GitHub repository at the link shown here at the folder location. To do that, go into your terminal and CD to your workshop directory. Remember to use PWD and LS to see where you currently are. Once you have CD'd into your workshop directory, you will run the git clone command by typing git space clone space the link that we provide at photo location. This will then download the GitHub repository to your account in the workshop directory. You will then see a new folder called intro to HPC that will have folders for office hours and workshop examples. Um, for this slides, we will use the workshop examples. We'll provide an exa example of interactive and batch um, allocations and computing. And with that, I will now pass it on to Aya Nawano. For the second half of this video, we'll be talking about how to actually run your applications on cluster. We've mentioned the term job several times during this video, but what does it mean in our context? Let's take a Grace cluster, for example, which has 29,000 CPUs shared by many research. Unlike your personal computer, where you have exclusive access to all the resources, here, we need to distribute these resources fairly among research tasks. To achieve this, we use a tool called Slurm in our clusters. Slurm helps organize and manage resource requests, grouping them into jobs and then scheduling them in an efficient and equitable way. Here is the general workflow for running jobs. Begin by submitting a request for resource allocation. For example, how long your task is going to take and how much memory you would need for your application. Then Slurm will identify and allocate the resources you have requested. With the allocated resources, you can run commands or execute your script. Once your task is completed, you or your script terminates the job and then the system will automatically free up the allocated resources. There are two types of jobs you can run on cluster. First, we have interactive jobs. You start by requesting compute resources from Slurm, and then you can run your applications interactively on cluster. This is similar to how you'd run your applications on your personal computer. This type of job is useful for script development and debugging. All open on-demand jobs, including Jupyter and RStudio, are interactive jobs as well. However, please keep in mind that you are restricted to having a maximum of four interactive sessions at a time. You can also submit your jobs as batch jobs. With batch jobs, you prepare a batch script that includes resource requests and series of commands you like to execute. Once you submit a batch script, the cluster will automatically carry out all the tasks specified in it. Unlike interactive jobs, you can run significantly larger number of batch jobs simultaneously. You also have an option to receive email notifications when your job starts and ends. These notifications can be useful for keeping track on your job progress. We will dive into both interactive and batch jobs in more detail for the rest of the video. Our compute nodes are grouped into partitions that serve different purposes. 
when submitting a job, you can choose the most appropriate partition or partitions for your job. For general purpose, we first have developed partition for an interactive job, which has a time limit of six hours. On Moongram class cluster, this partition is called interactive partition. The partition is suited for most batch job and has a hard time limit of 24 hours. Week partition is intended for jobs requiring a longer runtime than day partition allows. We also have partitions that serve several special purposes. For example, you can submit your job in GPU partition if your job can make use of GPUs. Big man partition is designed for jobs with RAM requirements beyond the capacity of other partitions. If your script is a tightly coupled Perl program that can efficiently use multiple nodes, you can use the MPI partition. We also have private partitions where PIs have purchased their own dedicated compute nodes. These nodes are exclusively available to the members of the respective research group. Scavenge partition utilizes idle nodes from other partitions. One advantage is that it allows you to run additional jobs beyond your typical limits. For example, on Grace, while the maximum number of CPUs a user can utilize simultaneously in a day partition is 1,000, but expands to 10,000 in scavenge partition. However, please note that the jobs in this partition may be preempted without any advance notice if any of the nodes your job is using is required for a job in its original partition. We install and manage commonly used software as modules, which are available to all users on clusters. To use a software package, you use the command module load. For example, by running the command module load quantum espresso 7.0 Intel 2020B, you can use the 7.0 version of Quantum Espresso. Intel 2020B specifies the tool chain, which defines the build environment, such as libraries and compilers that were used for the installation. To learn more about the tool chain, please refer to our documentation. You can also choose to load the default version of software by simply running module load software name. The default version is typically the newest version, so it can change as we install newer versions. You can also run module available software name to see which versions of the software are available in the cluster. To see currently loaded modules, you can run module list. To unload all modules, you can run module purge. This is particularly useful for unloading any unnecessary modules before loading the required modules for your applications. In this section, we are going to discuss interactive jobs. We will first introduce some commonly used learn commands and flags for specifying resource requests. Etholog is a command used to submit an interactive job. While using etholog, you can specify resource requests with flags. With dash p or dash dash partition, you can specify which partition you like to run your job in. If you do not specify this flag, the default is develop partition. <clears throat> Please note that there are some partitions you cannot run an interactive job, uh, such as MPI partition. Dash T or dash dash time defines how long your job is allowed to run. Once this time is time limit is reached, your job will be automatically canceled. Dash dash mem per CPU is to specify the memory limit per CPU. By default, it is set to five gigabytes per CPU. If your script is paralyzed through multi-threading, you can use dash dash CPUs dash per task to specify the number of CPUs that you like your script to run with. Or if your script is paralyzed with MPI, you can set the number of nodes and number of tasks with dash dash nodes or dash dash end tasks. As an example, if you like to request an interact session for an hour in the develop partition, you can run the command slog-t10000. For this section, we are going to demonstrate to run a Python code in an interactive session. Um, this Python code that we are going to run has an error. So when you run it, it 
um, it shows an error and then we are going to open the Python code and then fix it. So first we'll navigate to a folder called interactive example and then request an interactive session for an hour and we load the Python module. We run the Python script and then we open and edit the Python script with an editor to correct the error. And then we run the script again to make sure that the output is correct. And then we exit from the interactive session and release the resources. This is a good example of showing how you can use interactive session to do debugging of your code. So we'll go to a terminal. So if you have not uh, downloaded the, our intro to HPC folder, you can do so with git clone https colon slash slash github.com slash ycrc slash intro to hpc. So this will, once you hit enter, it will um, download the folder. So I have already done that. So now I have the folder in my project directory. So I will navigate to an interactive example folder by going to intro to HPC, workshop example, and then interactive example. When I hit LS, I see that there is a Python script code interpyexample.py. So now I will request an interactive session for an hour with slog command. Now the Slurm has allocated resources. And then you can see that I my, my job is on this node called R602U15N01. So now I load the Python module. So module load Python 3.8.6, CCC core 10.2.0. So when I do module list, to, to list the loaded module, I see that the Python module is loaded. And then other modules are also loaded that are, that are necessary to use this Python module. And then to run the Python script, I do python inter pyexample.py. And then it gives him an error. Um, it says it's a syntax error, invalid syntax uh, in line four. So we're gonna take a look at the inside of the script to see if we can fix the error. So this is a code that has a function called message decode tutorial. So what this is doing is it's taking a message and then this function will take every thief letter and then return that um, deciphered message. And um, the input of this um, function is this message. And then um, it's asking, taking the 10th letter of this message here and then prints out the deciphered code. Um, so the line four has an error. If you're familiar with Python, you might notice that it is missing a colon. So let's put a colon here. And then save. To save, you do control X, Y, and then enter. So let's try to run the the script again to make sure that the output is correct. So Python inter pi double dot pi. And now the, it's not giving an error and the output says, welcome to the YCRC. So we're still in the interactive session. So let's exit from the interactive session to release the resources. So to do that, we run exit.
As we saw in the previous exercise, we do have Python installed as module, but the available packages are limited. For installing various Python packages of specific version, Miniconda is a very useful tool. With Miniconda, you can easily manage packages and their dependencies. To create a Conda environment, first request an interactive session with Ethelock and load Miniconda module and run Conda create n, the name of the environment, and then list of all the packages that you would like to install in, in this environment. Um, after the initial creation, you can activate the environment with Conda activate environment name. With the Conda environment activated, you can also install additional packages with Conda install um, or pip install. We recommend using Conda install as much as possible and only use pip install when it is necessary. Please do not create a Conda environment or install packages in a login node. Uh, which often causes some issues. Um, after the initial setup, uh, to use the Conda environment in your interactive job or batch job, uh, you first load the Miniconda with module Miniconda, and then Conda activate environment name, and then you can run your Python code in that environment. In the next section, we will discuss open on-demand jobs. So open on-demand jobs are also considered interactive jobs. So let's go to the Grace open on-demand dashboard here. Um, some commonly used applications are pinned in the, the dashboard. So we have Jupyter, which um, has both Jupyter Notebook and Jupyter Lab. Uh, MATLAB app, we have remote desktop, which is useful for software that has graphical interface. Uh, we have two RStudio applications, RStudio server and RStudio desktop. Um, the difference is that RStudio server uses R modules and then RStudio desktop uses Kona environment with R packages in it. For most R users, RStudio Server will be the best option for you. Uh, to see the full list of all the available applications, you can click this All Available Apps link. In this video, we are going to take a look at Jupyter. So when you click this Jupyter app, uh, it takes you to a page with, where you can request a Jupyter session. Um, Let's first take a look at the second half of this page. So, which is similar to how you request resources for an interactive job in Terminal. So you specify the number of nodes, number of hours, number of CPU cores per node, memory per CPU in G gigabyte uh, partition. So this is very similar. Um, the big difference is that it also asks you an environment setup. So this is where you select the, the Conda environment that you want to run your Jupyter in. So by default, everyone has this YCRC default environment. Uh, this has a bare minimum so that you can run Jupyter or Jupyter, uh, Jupyter Notebook or Jupyter Lab. Um, but to have more specific versions of Python packages, uh, you will need to create a Conda environment first and then uh, run this ycrc conda env.sh update command to update the list in this um, um, in this open on demand. So right now I have ycrc default uh, and then my m and ycrc m. These are the conda environments that I created before. Um, so let's create a new Conda environment and um, update on this open on demand together. So let's go to a terminal. So I'm on Grace terminal and um, let's first request an interactive session with SLOC. And once the resource is allocated, um, I can do module load mini Conda. And then I will 
create a conda environment called um intro m and then I will like a Python, let's say 3.9 pandas. To use Jupyter, you will need Jupyter and Jupyter Lab packages. So I will include those. And then hit enter. And I will start creating. Once the Conda environment is created, we can run the command to update the list of Conda environments. Um, this is the command. When you run this command right after you created a Conda environment, sometimes you get this um, error. It's basically saying that you cannot run this command if you have mini Conda loaded as a module. So we can either exit from this compute session and then run the command again, or we can run module purge to unload the Miniconda module. So let's say module purge. The warning that you get when you run module purge is it's saying that the standard environment was not unloaded. This is expected, and then we want to have standard environment loaded at all times since they have a lot of important settings for the cluster environment. Um, but now we have unloaded Miniconda, so we can run that same command again. And it, success it successfully updates the list. Um, now we go back to Jupyter. And um, now the intro to M environment intro env is available um and then we can request a Jupyter session uh, well, after you request a Jupyter session um, it gets queued in the partition so sometimes it takes a while for it to start um, now the session started so we can connect to Jupyter And so you can um, run your Jupyter Notebook here. And after you're done to properly quit Jupyter Notebook, um, you press shut down and it shuts down the Jupyter. And then it completes the session. And now the resource has been released. In this section, we will discuss how to submit batch jobs. We will begin by introducing some common Slurm commands for batch jobs. sbatch is used to submit a batch job. You can check your job status using sq-me, which provides information such as whether your jobs are running or pending, as well as their runtime so far. Each job is assigned a unique job ID, and you can retrieve job statistics after completion with the theft job ID command. To cancel a submitted job, you can use s cancel job ID. Now we will discuss common flags for batch jobs. There are some overlaps with the interactive session, um, but however, several flags are particularly useful for batch jobs. For example, you can use dash j or dash dash job name to specify the job's name and dash o or dash dash output to customize the output file name. By default, it is learn slash job id dot out. If you wish to receive email notifications when your job starts and finishes, you can set dash dash mail dash user to be uh, your email address and then dash dash mail dash type to be all. If you do not set dash dash mail dash user uh, to be an email address, uh, by default, it's going to be sent to your Yale email. This is an example batch script named my underscore batch dot sh. 
The first line is crucial as it specifies the interpreter for this bat script as bash. The next four lines are flown flags. The dash J flag assigns the name example underscore job to this job. The dash key flag specifies that it will run in the day partition. The dash key flag sets a time limit of 12 hours for this job's execution. Lastly, the dash dash mail dash type equal all directive instructs learn to send email notifications when the job uh, starts and complete. One useful tip is that you can list multiple partition names with the dash key flag. Then Slurm will schedule your job to run in the first available partition. The next four lines are a series of commands that you like to execute. This is an example of how you'd run a Python script with a Conda environment. First, you will do module purge to unload any unnecessary modules that are accidentally loaded. And then you can load the mini Conda module and then activate the Conda environment. Then you can run your Python script with Python command. To submit this batch script, you can run the command sbatch my underscore batch.sh uh, from a login node. In this exercise, we'll practice creating a batch script to execute an R script and submitting a job. We will also look at how to monitor job while it is running and get job statistics and output after the job is completed. Let's go back to the terminal. If you have not downloaded our folder, you can do so with git clone and then the link here. Um, and I have intro to HPC folder in the workshop directory in my project. Uh, so I will do cd intro to HPC, cd workshop examples, and then cd batch example. So here you will see two files, xlearn.sh and mc.r. So we are going to um, edit the xlearn.sh, which is the bat script, and we are going to run an R script, mc.r. So let's take a look at xlearn.sh. Um, <clears throat> So here we will try to complete this batch script so that you can submit a job. Um, so right now we are not um, in the workshop. So we'll change this to run it in a day partition. And then we will name our job as MC test. So dash j is to specify the name of the job so we'll change to mc test and we'll request one gigabyte of memory per cpu since we are not specifying the number of cpus in this batch script it's going to run with one cpu and we'll next request 10 minutes of runtime with dash t so we'll change it to 10, 0, 0. And then we like to receive an email notification when the job starts and complete. Um, so we'll set the dash dash mail type to be all. And we'll move on to the series of commands that we like to execute. To remove any loaded modules, we'll run module purge. <clears throat> So this will get rid of any unnecessary modules that are accidentally loaded. And to load the R module, we'll put module load R 4.3.0 plus 2020B. So this will enable us to run an R script we are running um, an R script called mc.r, so we'll change this to mc.r. So now we are done with editing. So we save this with Control X, uh, press Y, and Enter. 
Um, so now we are ready to submit this bot script. <laughs> so please note that we are on a login node. So we'll do sbatch xlearn.sh. So once you submit a job, it gives you a unique job ID here. Um, ours is 27990273. To um to monitor currently running jobs, you can run the command sq dash dash me. Um, so it gives you that um I have this job running, um, and it has been one second since they started running. So one important part is the note list. This is the compute node that this job is running on. So to monitor the CPU utilization in real time, uh, we can log into this compute node and then open up htop. So to log into the compute node, you can do ssh and the note name, and then to open up htop and see your job running, do htop-u, your net ID. And you see that there's one CPU running at 100%, uh, running an R script called mc.r. This is what we expect. So to close this htop, you do control C. And to log out from this compute node, uh, we run exit. And now we are back to a login node. Once the job has completed, you can get job statistics with staff job ID. And it gives you an information such as uh, whether the job has completed or failed, um, how much CPU utilization it was. So as we saw in the HDOP, one CPU was running at 100%. So you see that uh, the, the value is close to 100% here how long the job has taken, um, and then how much memory was utilized. So in this case, uh, it utilized about 123 megabytes, which is about 12% of what we requested. This information is particularly useful. If you're not sure how much memory your job uses, uh, you can try running a job with uh, some memory requests and then run Ceph, uh command to see um, how much it actually used, and then adjust your future request accordingly. Um, so when you do a list in this folder, you also see an output file called slurm jobidout uh, We can take a look at inside of this file with cat slurm the out file. Um, so the first few lines are the warning that comes from Mojo Purge but the last line is an output from an R script that says MC approximation of pi. So next we're gonna do a little bit of an experiment. So we're gonna change our CPU request to be two. So we'll edit the xlearn.sh to request two CPUs and see if we can actually improve the performance that way. So we'll open up xlearn.sh and then we'll add a line here. Um, increase the num number of CPUs to two. So to increase the number of CPUs per task, you use dash C flag, and then we'll set it to two. And we save this file. And we'll submit again. And you see that the, the job ID has changed. So every job has a unique job ID. So when you do SS sq dot dash dash me um you see that the job is currently running and then you can get the the note name here so we'll do ssh to 
the computer to take a look at the htop. htop u uh, net ID. Um, so right now it's saying that once if you is loading the R module, and now it's running the uh, mc.r. But as you can see, it looks exactly the same as when we requested only one CPU. Uh, it is not using the second CPU at all. And we'll exit from the compute node. Once the job has completed, we can run Ceph command again with the new job ID. And um, now it says the CPU efficiency is close to 50% instead of 100%. This is because only one CPU was utilized at 100%, but the second CPU was not utilized at all. And it also says that the the runtime is about two minutes and 54 seconds, uh, which was almost exactly the same as when you used one CPU, which was two minutes and 52 seconds. So even though we requested um, additional CPU, it did not give any speed up. Take away message from this is that just because uh, you request more resources uh, such as CPUs, it does not mean that you will see a performance improvement. But some code or scripts are indeed uh, paralyzed and can utilize multiple CPUs to speed up the performance. So if you think your um, applications can run with multiple CPUs, try with a smaller number of CPUs first. So for example, um, start with two or three CPUs and see uh, if all the CPUs are efficiently utilized uh, with HTOP. Since cluster resources are shared by everybody, please be mindful of how you utilize your resources. And if you're not actively using the resources, please uh, release them so that other people can use it. Lastly, I will briefly discuss job arrays. Suppose you want to analyze a thousand similar data sets with script and each analysis can be performed independently. In that case, instead of analyzing all the data sets sequentially within a single job, you can split this task down into a thousand jobs. In addition, rather than preparing a thousand batch scripts and submitting them as individual jobs, we strongly recommend using job arrays to submit all thousand tasks with just one batch script. We provide a tool called DSQ to assist users in creating a batch script that can submit job arrays. For more details, please take a look at our documentation. Because you're submitting one batch script, you will receive one job ID for all thousand tasks. This simplifies the task management. For example, with DSQ, you can use DSQA command to get statuses of all your tasks. In this last section, we will discuss some common errors and their solutions, as well as resources provided by Yale Center for Research Computing. Let's address some common issues that researchers often encounter on their solution. First, please do not run any computations on our login nodes. Researchers often run into errors when attempting to create a conda environment on a login node. To avoid this issue, please make sure that you request an interactive compute session. If you find that RStudio on open on demand is unresponsive or unusually slow, please terminate all active RStudio sessions and then execute the clean rstudio.sh script in your terminal. This action will clear the cache and allows a fresh RStudio session. You're allowed to have a maximum of four interactive sessions in total, and only one interactive session is permitted in the devel partition. Any attempt to request additional interactive sessions will result in an error. 
If you're facing difficulties such as the inability to create files or content environments or open on-demand applications are not appearing as expected, please run the get quarter command. This allows you to check your storage usage and ensure that you're not exceeding your storage quota. Lastly, if you encounter issues that you're unable to resolve, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. We've discussed modules earlier in this video, but if you're interested in software that aren't currently not installed, please reach out to us. We can either install it as a module on cluster or help you install it within your account. If you have any questions or issues related to HPC cluster, the best way to reach us to email us at hpc.el.edu. We have our website at research.computing.yale.edu uh, that discusses what we do and then HPC cluster user guide at this link. We also have an office hour on Zoom from 11 a.m. to noon every Wednesday. A couple of research support staff will be available to answer your quick questions. We also regularly update this link for upcoming workshops or training opportunities, so please stay tuned. We are looking forward to working with you to make your computational research on HPC as smooth as possible. Please feel free to reach out to us if you require any, any assistance. Thank you for listening and have a great day.